of the men and women who came out of exile and out of prison in the early 1990s foresaw that the divide between rich and poor in South Africa would not shrink after liberation, but would widen. And who imagined the nightmare of disease about to envelop the country? These are fresh AIDS graves outside a small town in KwaZulu-Natal. The first recorded case of AIDS in South Africa was diagnosed in 1982. In 1985, the first paper on HIV AIDS to be published in the country forecast that the disease would remain largely confined to gay men as had been the case in America and Europe. But it was soon evident that this was not so. As liberation from apartheid was being celebrated, already more than a half a million people were infected. South Africa had started on the path to becoming the country with the largest number of HIV infections on earth and more deaths from AIDS each year than all other countries. Why? One reason was cultural. Anything to do with sex was never to be discussed in public. Anyone who dared to mention oral sex was un-African, according to Jacob Zuma, who would become South Africa's fourth president. Only those who behaved immorally or were sexually promiscuous got AIDS. Audiences were shocked when Mandela after his release from prison and before the 1994 election, tried to engage them on the danger facing the country and the importance of preventative measures like condom use. Why bring all that up before decent people? On occasion after occasion, angry muttering would greet the 75-year-old liberation hero. He gave up. During the five years of his presidency, he avoided mentioning AIDS. Only after his return to private life did he resume speaking out. Yet even as the realization spread that AIDS was striking and killing tens of thousands whom none could suspect of promiscuity, the death curve continued to climb. Here the reason was a political decision. A decision by Thabo Mbeki, Mandela's successor as president, to not represent AIDS as the product of a virus, but as a disease caused by poverty. This represented a 180 degree turn from his starting position. At first, Mbeki accepted the scientific consensus that AIDS was caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. With President Mandela cowed by hostile audience reactions into virtually ignoring the disease, then Deputy President Mbeki stepped forward in support of the campaign against AIDS. He headed an interministerial committee to seek ways to mobilize against it. On October 9, 1998, the future president of South Africa addressed his countrymen and women in a beautifully crafted speech on HIV AIDS. Here are some extracts. For too long, we have closed our eyes as a nation, hoping the truth was not so real. For many years, we have allowed the HIV virus to spread. Every single day, a further 1,500 people in South Africa get infected. To date, more than 3 million people have been infected. The danger is real. HIV AIDS walks with us. It travels with us wherever we go. 
We have experienced AIDS in the groans of wasting lives. We have carried it in small and big coffins to many graveyards. By allowing it to spread, we face the danger that half of our youth will not reach adulthood. Their education will be wasted. The economy will shrink. There will be a large number of sick people whom the healthy will not be able to maintain. Our dreams as a people will be shattered. HIV spreads mainly through sex. You have the right to live your life the way you want to. But I appeal to the young people who represent our country's future to abstain from sex for as long as possible. If you decide to engage in sex, use a condom. In the same way, I appeal to both men and women to be faithful to each other, but otherwise to use condoms. We shall work together to support medical institutions to search for a vaccine and a cure. We shall mobilize all possible resources to spread the message of prevention, to offer support to those infected and affected, to destigmatize HIV and AIDS, and to continue our search for a medical solution. However, Soon after delivering that speech, Mabeki would reject with tragic effect each key point he had made. He would spurn the scientific consensus that AIDS was caused by a virus. He would deny that it was a sexually transmitted disease. He would even deny knowing anyone who had ever died from AIDS. Why? It is a depressing story. When the government's newly created Interministerial Committee on AIDS first met in 1997, Mbeki and his colleagues faced an advancing health disaster that seemed uncontrollable. The only hopeful treatment was a combination therapy of three antiretroviral drugs. This was impossibly expensive. One month's supply for a single person cost the Rand equivalent of $868. To supply the therapy to the nearly two million already infected would have cost $18 billion, a sum which would consume almost half the national budget of $37 billion. How could the ANC leaders who had promised a better life for all, make any headway into the massive problems already before them with the HIV virus on the loose. Then a miracle appeared, so it seemed. In January 1997, Ancosa Zana Dlamini Zuma, the Minister of Health, was contacted by a team of researchers who reported that they had developed a special compound for HIV-infected persons. This, after informal trials, proved, quote, far superior and effective than any known treatment to date worldwide, unquote. They had patented their drug under the name Virodine. It was effective at any stage of infection. Terminal cases had been reversed. Patients had regained health and picked up as much as 12 pounds within one month. The number of viruses dropped an average of 88.8%, while cells of the immune system increased an average of 73.4%. Side effects were minimal. After this amazing news was passed to him by the Minister of Health, Deputy President Mbeki arranged for the lead researcher, Olga Fisser, a medical technician at the Pretoria Hospital, two University of Pretoria surgeons who had assisted her, and several of their patients to make a presentation to the cabinet. The ministers were told that Virodine 
appeared to reverse full-blown AIDS to HIV positive. The drug had completely destroyed HIV in a test tube. Three more years of development could lead to a cure. The HIV AIDS patients testified to their remarkable recovery. At the close of the presentation, the cabinet stood up in spontaneous applause. How unexpectedly did optimism and delight replace despair? A patient's month's supply of Viridine, the cabinet was told, could be had for between 80 and 160 rands, or 17 to 34 dollars. In other words, one fiftieth, or at most, one twenty-fifth the cost of the American drug AZT. To top this off, Viridine would be an African lifesaver made in South Africa by South African scientists under the sheltering wing of the first African National Congress government. The world's first heart transplant had been performed in South Africa in 1967. Viridine promised to prolong lives throughout the world, but in the tens of millions. And cryopreservation technologies, the company which Olga Fisser and her businessman husband had formed to obtain the patent and to perfect and market the drug, was poised to earn billions for the country in foreign exchange. A health disaster that had threatened to deep six all hope and promise of a better life, instead seemed on the verge of generating waves of new tax revenues and the means to produce a better life for all. And as cryopreservation technologies would need more capital to meet the cost of human trials, large volume production, marketing and distribution, here also were opportunities for investors close at hand, perhaps including the ruling ANC itself. In April 1997, Mbeki proclaimed the dawn of the African Renaissance. Those who have eyes to see, let them see. The African Renaissance is upon us. As we peer through the looking glass darkly, this may not be obvious, but it is upon us. Professor Peter Falb was head of the Medicines Control Council, South Africa's drug regulatory agency counterpart to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The first he heard about the cabinet presentation was two days later when he was contacted by a reporter. He soon learned that 11 infected volunteers had been administered viridine without prior animal studies, indeed without any of the legally required protocols for administration of new drugs. Viridine now had to be submitted for analysis. After completing its study, the Control Council reported that the formula contains a highly toxic industrial solvent which may cause irreversible fatal liver damage. No antiviral action had been found. The cryopreservation technologies researchers had made numerous mistakes. Further testing of viridine on human subjects in South Africa would not be permitted unless its safety and efficacy was proven. Despite the suspension of testing and news that the drug contained a toxic industrial solvent used in dry cleaning, government leaders were not prepared to fall again into the deep despond from which they had just emerged. How could they ignore that with their own eyes they had seen people who should have been bedridden, wasting away, coughing and vomiting, instead as Mbeki told the press, walking about perfectly all right. Not only had the researchers produced exciting results, Minister Dlamini Zuma added, their research also 
had implications for manufacturing at an affordable price. The researchers should receive government funding after certain technicalities are dealt with. Developments proceeded on several parallel tracks. On one, Chairman Fulb was summoned to successive meetings with the health minister separately, with Mbeki alone, and with the deputy president and the Verudine researchers together to see if the Medicines Control Council would not lift its ban on the drug. Minister Dlamini Zuma told the journalist, It breaks my heart to see the number of letters I receive from patients who are dying, wanting Verudine to be administered to them. I often cry in my office as I feel powerless. I am, however, convinced that one day I will have an enabling law that will allow me to overrule the MCC. The Secretary General of the ANC held a press conference where he accused the MCC, the Medicine Control Council, of having ulterior motives in banning tests on Viridine and implied that it was doing the bidding of foreign pharmaceutical manufacturers. Less than three weeks later, Fall was fired, and his two most senior staff were given the option of resignation with a severance package or being suspended and charged with misconduct. However, it transpired that Forbes' replacement as chairman also refused to allow testing of the drug. Blocked in South Africa, the Viridine manufacturers sought permission from other countries to conduct clinical trials. But they lacked money for this and were even about to miss the fee payments on their own patent. The physicists explained this in a fax to Mbeki, in which they requested his assistance. The upshot was that cryopreservation technologies were swallowed up in a new company, in which Olga Fisser, her husband, and the other original investors retained a minority share. The identity of all majority owners and investors was kept hidden. If these included the ruling party or its officials, as suggested by various court documents made public, this would represent a conflict of interest. And that would help explain the government's long refusal to purchase and distribute antiretroviral drugs, which were being used effectively elsewhere. Despite the addition of funds, the FISA's application to run clinical trials in neighboring Botswana was turned down by its government. Not until September 2000, after Mbeki had succeeded Mandela as president, did the first and only stringent human trials begin. These were with 64 infected soldier volunteers at a military hospital in Tanzania. It would take two years of testing and analysis before the Tanzanian investigators were able to report the results of the first real scientific trial of Verity on human subjects to the drugs promoters and to the South African government. While awaiting the results, the South African government refused to supply caregivers in its public health system with AZT, the leading antiretroviral drug. During these years, that is since March 1998, the American maker of AZT had been supplying it at one quarter the developed world price to pregnant women in the third world. This followed discovery that if AZT was taken in the final weeks of pregnancy, cases of mother to child transmission of the virus would be reduced by 50%. An estimated 40,000 HIV-infected infants were then born annually, half of whom could be saved from the virus. A short course nationwide rollout limited to infected pregnant women in South Africa was considered. This would have added four-tenths of one percent to South Africa's national health budget. Viridine's future then was still unresolved. Minister Dlamini Zuma decided 
not to proceed with an AZT rollout. AZT, she explained, is not cost-effective because we don't have the money. The health minister's decision to save $15 million by not supplying AZT to HIV-infected pregnant women was endorsed by the Interministerial Committee on AIDS, chaired by Deputy President Mbeki. He was chair also of another cabinet subcommittee, which five weeks earlier selected the winning bids, not on a question of $15 million, but on more than $5 billion worth of weapons purchases, including, as described in the previous episode, a British jet fighter twice as expensive as the Italian alternative favored by the South African Air Force. The angry backlash from white and black anti-AIDS activists could be discounted. Viridine though its testing in South Africa remained banned, was still in play. If it proved out, who would remember the effects of the current AZT turned-down decision? Indeed, the Viridine promoters were providing Becky periodically with upbeat news. He had just received two letters from them. One letter reported that the Botswana cabinet was about to approve funding for formal human trials of Viridine. The second letter informed him that a toxicity study in Britain was nearing completion, quote, with excellent results and absolutely no toxicity at proposed levels of doses. Money to cover additional expenses for this study was requested from him in the letter. He had it sent. An effective and inexpensive treatment for HIV-AIDS coming from South Africa in the not-too-distant future would shame the government's critics and make the world take notice of leaders who had shepherded a miracle drug to success against homegrown opposition. Meanwhile, those who complained that a rollout of reduced-cost AZT would have only a minor impact on the budget, didn't reckon on the full cost, according to Parks Mankalana, Mabeki's spokesman. Cutting down on mother-to-child transmission, he explained to Science Magazine, would increase the number of surviving orphans. That mother is going to die, he pointed out, and that HIV-negative child will be an orphan. That child must be brought up. Who is going to bring the child up? It's the state. The state. That's resources, you see. Mbeki was inaugurated South Africa's second post-apartheid president in June 1999. He could not have felt easy about being held responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of infants. But the entire public health system was nearing collapse. There was no keeping up with the thousands of new beds and bed spaces needed every year to try to ease the suffering of the deadly virus's victims and their families. Half the medications furnished by the state to its public hospitals were being stolen, winding up in the high-priced private sector. Small wonder that the World Health Organization was about to rate the overall performance of South Africa's health system 175th out of 191 countries studied, worse than Niger's and just above Chad's. The pressure to supply AZT to infected pregnant women was one amongst so many contending pressures in a country where nearly half the population was trying to extend their own lives on less than $2 a day. Then there were the pressures coming from the prosperous 
from international and domestic markets to keep the state's budget deficit to within 3% of GDP or face a rise in interest rates. Rising interest rates would subtract resources needed to ease other pressures. There was the budgetary strain of repaying more than $25 billion worth of foreign debt passed over from the apartheid regime and the even larger apartheid era debt owed to domestic creditors, none of whom needed a job, unlike millions of South Africans who would have been grateful to dig ditches if there had been enough money in the Treasury to expand public works. The contagiousness of the political atmosphere in which South Africa's president had to operate is reflected in the fact that spokesman Mankalana felt obliged to spell out the ABCs of his boss's intentions. You know, Mbeki wants to wake up in the morning and see the South African economy grow. He wants to see jobs being created. He wants to see crime levels coming to zero. He wants to see lodgings of people improve. But it was hard to square refusal to spend the small amount required to prevent mother to child HIV transmission, even if larger sums would then be needed to care for HIV negative orphans, with a decision to spend billions on weapons purchases. Even weapon types costlier by far than the types the military chiefs themselves preferred. Mbeki couldn't acknowledge that his arms deals were undertaken not because the apartheid regime had left South Africa inadequately armed, but because his political interests seemed to require them. He was not a popular leader, like Mandela. He had not suffered imprisonment. He had not been a street fighter for liberation within the country, nor an armed combatant or military leader in exile. He had gone to college in Britain, studied economics, learned to smoke a pipe, became some snicket an impimpy, a black Englishman in tweeds. His use of words like paradigm with interviewers seemed designed to establish his intellectual heft, but made many of his countrymen scratch their heads. Oliver Tambo, the ANC president in exile, had selected him as an advisor and speechwriter. He had gained stature independently for his effectiveness in persuading colleagues at all levels of the ANC to abandon their impossible dream of ousting the apartheid regime militarily, instead to enter into talks with it. The policy direction in which he had set the country after liberation, even though Mandela nominally was president, was not popular. During the years of his exile, he had seen the unpleasant, sometimes cruel fates that befell leaders who tried to deal with desperate poverty in their countries by spending and borrowing until they could borrow no more. He would avoid that fate. South Africa would not fall like many other countries had under the control of the foreign bankers of the International Monetary Fund. Spending would be aligned closely to revenues. But he would not boost revenues by increasing personal and corporate income tax rates, despite the fact that such increases would have fallen mainly on whites whose prosperity came from decades of racial exploitation and repression. Instead, to encourage foreign investment and discourage more flight from the country of experienced businessmen along with skilled white workers and professionals, both corporate and personal income tax rates were lowered. This and similar policies enraged many within the ANC. Even his father, Govan Mbeki, a communist liberation hero who had been sentenced together with Mandela to life imprisonment for terrorism and treason, saw fit to demean him. 
charging that his son had rolled over. Of all the arrows fired at him, probably this was the most cutting. Why did Mbeki decide or agree to spend billions to buy weapons, deals that had a negative impact on economic growth, like pouring money into the ground that could have been invested in infrastructure and education and health? Certainly, the weapons purchases were not designed to enhance his personal popularity nor answer any realistic national security need. Then why? Perhaps because his most pressing need was to keep key supporters from wavering. While in the UK, Mbeki had learned that cash flows emanating from international arms deals were two-directional. Billions to the arms manufacturers, billions flowing back to the deal makers. Here in South Africa, these included the Minister of Defense who had persuaded a reluctant Mandela in 1994 to make him Becky deputy president. It appears that money was also funneled by arms supplies into the coffers of the ANC. This would have enabled him Becky to manipulate party members other than those who had shaped the deals and had obtained kickbacks. Small wonder that Mandela stayed in the background while the arms deals were arranged, and while AZT was withheld from infected pregnant women who were dependent on the public health system. As for Mbeki, he was trying to steer forward a country so riven between wealth and poverty, and between satisfaction and envy and anger as South Africa continued to be after apartheid ended. It obliged him to shift off course and buy economically useless, expensive objects simply to remain at the wheel. His hope that Viridine might rescue his country and wipe away his own problems dimmed. As the government of Botswana decided not to fund clinical trials of the drug, he was left with his decision on AZT. It did not sit lightly on him. The press, the Opposition Democratic Alliance Party, and anti-AIDS activists of the newly formed Treatment Action Committee kept what he had done before the public. He could not put it out of mind. Then, just before his inauguration as president, he was pointed down a path which he continued thereafter to follow eagerly. Suddenly being presented to him was a whole body of work to be explored. Books, articles in scientific journals and on the internet, whose authors were united in denying that the HIV virus was the cause of AIDS. And to his immediate relief, that AZT was not an effective treatment for the disease, but a dangerous toxin, harmful to health, itself capable of causing AIDS. The authors were scientists and physicians in the US, Germany, Italy, Australia, and ethicists and journalists. Among the Americans were renowned scientists like Peter Duisberg, Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, the biochemist David Rasnick, the biologist Lynn Margulis, Carrie Mullis, winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and others. And Becky wasted little time contacting several of them by phone and email, then in person after having the government bring many of them to South Africa. They confirmed what he had been reading, that AIDS was neither sexually transmitted nor contagious. AIDS was nothing but a new name for diseases caused by malnutrition, poor sanitation, bad water, parasites, and other conditions affecting the poor. These were the conditions that suppressed the immune system, 
not the misnamed human immunodeficiency virus. HIV was a harmless passenger virus, like many others in the body. If HIV caused disease, it would produce symptoms specific to it, like other infectious agents. The chickenpox virus didn't cause dementia, it caused the chickenpox. The flu virus didn't cause cervical cancer, it caused the flu. HIV had no symptoms of its own. Antiretroviral drugs didn't help patients. They often wrecked their immune systems. He was now able to inform Parliament that while many were demanding that the government make AZT available in the public health system, it had been brought to the government's attention that lawsuits were pending against AZT's makers in the U.S. and the U.K., alleging that the drug was harmful to health and that it would be irresponsible for the government not to heed dire warnings which medical researchers had been making. He knew he would be attacked. But against the backdrop of the arms deal, it seemed less stressful to announce that AZT was turned down because of safety concerns than because of cost. He was careful not to open himself to more criticism by volunteering that the scientific consensus that HIV caused AIDS was wrong. This would have brought demands to account for the extensive evidence that had led to the consensus. For example, evidence showing transference of the virus from a single infected person to individuals with no prior risk factors and the subsequent deaths from AIDS on both sides of these exchanges, as from an infected dentist to his patients. Mbeki's emotional necessity was to sidestep this evidence. At ANC party venues, however, he needed to negate it, to discipline party members by setting forth a party position and providing them with talking points. He told ANC parliamentarians that 90% of the deaths in Africa attributed to AIDS were actually due to diseases of poverty and the rest to other illnesses. Party members had not forgotten the help given by the U.S. to the former apartheid regime both Mbeki and Mandela were still on the U.S. terrorist watch list. The members heard from their leader that antiretrovirals were poisonous toxins that were being used by the big U.S. pharmaceutical companies to exploit Africa for profit. Africans were their guinea pigs. The CIA was working covertly alongside the pharmaceutical manufacturers to undermine him because by questioning the link between HIV and AIDS and by warning about the toxicity of their antiretrovirals, he posed a threat to their profits. He may have known from the Parliamentary Medical Scheme Committee, which paid for the members' medications, that already 68 out of the 400 MPs were obtaining antiretrovirals to contain their own HIV positive status. Nevertheless, they wouldn't dare to challenge him because South Africa's system of proportional representation gave party leaders the power to choose which party members would appear on the party's list for election, even the power to expel and switch list members in and out of parliament at will. The solid backing of the ANC top leadership for Mbeki's position on AIDS, however, began to fray as he was about to succeed Mandela as president. At a meeting on AIDS three months before the switch, Mandela apologized for his long silence on the subject. Once out of office, he went further. After watching some of his relatives die, and a cousin's child recover 
After taking antiretrovirals, he infuriated Mbeki by declaring publicly that HIV causes AIDS. Subsequently, at a meeting of the National Executive Committee, the party's highest policy-making body, he appealed to make these drugs available in the public health system to infected pregnant women and rape victims. Only two of the 80-member body supported him. The other members vied with each other in denouncing him, none more vehemently than Peter Makoba, head of the ANC's Youth League, who would die less than three months later for what was described as respiratory problems, widely believed to have been AIDS. Makoba had been taking antiretrovirals himself, but had ceased taking them. Time and again Mandela tried to meet with Mbeki to raise his concerns over AIDS policy, but the new president refused to take his calls. While Mandela was receiving the accolades of the world, becoming its chief hero and saint, the heavy lifting had fallen to him, Mbeki, and with it had come unceasing attacks as he worked trying to match the country's limited resources to its near limitless needs. Could Mandela keep his thoughts to himself? loyal party man that he was supposed to be? Mbeki tried to enlist the immunologist and physician William Makoba on his side. Makoba was the first African head of the South African Medical Research Council. Mbeki sent him 1,500 pages of the writings of Duisburg and other prominent AIDS dissidents who denied the link between HIV and AIDS, to no avail. Magoba held to the scientific mainstream and warned Mbeki in an article written shortly after for the journal Science that Mbeki's policy on antiretrovirals could result in the greatest genocide of our time. Fresh concerns had separated Mbeki and his cabinet colleagues from their initial unquestioning acceptance of the scientific consensus on the connection between HIV and AIDS and on the benefit of antiretroviral treatment. Infected pregnant women, they were learning, were but the tip of an iceberg of treatment cost, which would wreck the government's policy of economic austerity and cut deeply into or render impossible all poverty relief programs. The costs of antiretroviral treatment would not be a one-time outlay. They would have to be borne for each infected person's lifetime, multiplied by the ever-rising number of the infected. The Assistant Secretary General of the ANC at the time pointed out Making antiretroviral drugs available is only one side of the story. The state will have to take responsibility for all the costs of AIDS-infected individuals. The state doesn't have that kind of capacity or resources. And Becky's finance minister, Trevor Manuel, was more blunt. The rhetoric about the effectiveness of antiretrovirals is a lot of voodoo, and buying them would be a waste of limited resources. Manuel, as we have seen, had been imprisoned repeatedly in the fight to liberate the country from apartheid. He had won international recognition for his achievements as finance minister, leading to his appointment to the governing boards of both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. He lined up solidly with Mbeki, remarking at a closed hearing of a committee that investigated the feasibility of a basic income grant, it does not make financial sense to spend money on people dying anyway, who are not even productive in the first place. This sounds terrible, 
but the arithmetic Becky Manuel and their cabinet colleagues faced is stunning. In 2000, one year into their administration, separating out pregnant women with HIV dependent on the public health system to whom they had denied the relatively inexpensive short course antiretroviral treatment, that is, counting only the other more than 4 million HIV positive South Africans. The cost per patient, $10,400 to provide each of the 4 million with a single year supply of the then most effective triple drug combination would have totaled $41 billion. That is, more than the entire national budget. One medication set for just one year. Impossible. And this sum didn't include hospital and other costs of care. Societies have deliberately risked the health and lives of some members for the benefit of the rest. In peacetime as well as in wartime, without exception. Although South Africa's government didn't have enough money to buy all the HIV medications needed, there would have been enough to prolong some lives. Cemeteries were filling up with great speed, yet the state's leaders decided, with no prospect of an external threat, to spend billions to add to existing stores of armaments. stores which included brand new Cheetah C jet fighters, some still in their crates. Costs, therefore, couldn't be maintained by Mbeki as the reason why anti-HIV drugs were not to be provided to poor citizens who couldn't afford to seek treatment outside the public health system. He couldn't explain that kickbacks funneled by foreign arms manufacturers to the party treasury which he controlled, and to the private accounts of key supporters, like the Minister of Defense, assuring that their support would not waver as he came under mounting attack for a multitude of reasons, from the opposition parties, from most of the press, from healthcare workers and AIDS activists, even from the ANC's own alliance partners, the Congress of South African Trade Unions and the Communist Party. The AIDS dissidents offered a way out. Antiretroviral drugs were being withheld because, as these prominent scientists, including a Nobel Prize winner, insisted, these drugs were not safe. And they were inappropriate because AIDS wasn't caused by a virus. But it was embarrassingly difficult to stick to this position. If AIDS was mainly a disease caused by the circumstances of poverty, critics demanded, why were HIV rates lower and AIDS deaths fewer in poorer African countries, where the poor went without child support and other government payments that were provided to South Africa's poor? And if poverty, and not the HIV virus, was the real killer, why were numbers of well-off South Africans, including a prince and princess of the Zulu royal family, also dying of AIDS? Even a close relative and friends of Mbeki were brought down. Even his own spokesman, Parks Mankalana, had loyally bought into his boss's stance on AIDS. A few months before his own death, he declared that Mbeki would consign to the dustbins a declaration by 5,000 doctors and scientists that HIV is the cause of AIDS. Reports that he himself had become HIV positive began to circulate in 2000 after he had undergone obligatory blood tests in the course of paternity suits brought by two women. Mbeki visited him several times as his illness progressed. The last visit, occurring 30 hours before the 36-year-old died, left the president in a state of deep shock, the press was told. 
When Becky advised ANC party members that Mancalana died because he had been persuaded by AIDS doctors into consuming antiretrovirals. And Becky knew that AIDS deaths had been brought down sharply in the developed world after the triple combination antiretroviral medication was introduced there. This must have added to his disquiet as he prepared for a state visit to the U.S where he knew a most unpleasant reputation had preceded him. Driven to explain himself in advance of the visit, he composed a five-page letter to President Clinton. When Clinton read the letter, he thought it must be a hoax. He sent it to the State Department requesting verification of the signature, a question then taken up by the embassy in Pretoria. The letter begins with a long series of short paragraphs on the, quote, work we are doing to respond to the HIV-AIDS epidemic. Nothing mentioned here seems in any way remarkable or deserving of special attention. President Clinton and other world leaders who received copies already knew that AIDS had killed many more persons in Africa than anywhere else. They also knew that most victims in Africa were heterosexual. They would not be impressed by paragraphs of statistics and sources to pound this in. But as the remainder of the letter made clear, Mbeki was hoping that the letter's recipients would accept what he wanted them to accept. That AIDS in Africa was a distinct disease, unlike AIDS elsewhere. It would be criminally irresponsible of him not to search for a specific and targeted response to this distinctly African catastrophe. He was being condemned merely for consulting noted scientists who, because they thought outside the mainstream, were considered dangerous and discredited, like the heretics of an earlier period, who were burnt at the stake. How could he be expected to follow the example of the racist apartheid regime which had prohibited dissent? The leaders of the US, the UK, Germany, France, and the others who received copies of the letter commanded far greater resources for combating disease. The problems of poverty and inequality they faced were far smaller than those Mbeki had to deal with. They had no experience of being on the receiving end of racial oppression and exploitation. It seemed to them unquestionable that their pharmaceutical companies should recoup the costs and be rewarded for the risks of undertaking drug development, which included lengthy, expensive, and uncertain safety and efficacy trials. That antiretroviral drug prices then put life-prolonging treatment out of reach of Africa's HIV-infected millions was hardly among their pressing concerns. What led Becky to imagine his letter would be favorably received is not known. Perhaps the then still solid backing he was receiving from his own 29-member cabinet skewed his judgment. Principal among his cabinet support on AIDS policy was his own appointee as the country's health minister, Manto Chabalala Bisimang. He had known her for close on half a century since they attended Fort Hare, the segregated black college, during apartheid. Both had gone into exile together in 1961. In 1969, Manto, as she was widely known, graduated with a medical degree from the first Leningrad Medical Institute in the Soviet Union. Three years later, she achieved a diploma in obstetrics and gynecology from the medical school of the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and then went on to earn a master's degree in public health from the University of Antwerp 
in Belgium. She founded the ANC's health department in exile and engaged pre-1994 in planning the movement's attack on AIDS once liberation was achieved, never questioning then that it was a viral disease. Between her medical studies in Tanzania and Belgium, while serving as director of a public hospital in Botswana, she was arrested, tried and convicted on charges of stealing a watch from the wrist of a patient under anesthetic, and of stealing hats, handbags and jewelry from patients. Botswana declared her a prohibited immigrant and expelled her to Tanzania. This became public knowledge in South Africa only 30 years later. An ANC spokesman then explained that President Becky had known, but any sentence under 12 months did not disqualify a person from inclusion on the party list for membership in Parliament. In picking her to head the health ministry, Becky could be confident about her complete loyalty. The price she paid was to become a figure of ridicule as she was sucked by the country's unforgiving crosswinds of great angry needs and woefully inadequate means into the same whirlpool of denial and contradiction as a Becky. The clash between her training in public health and her obligation to a Becky restrained her from ever giving a straight answer to whether HIV caused AIDS. In one interview, she was harried into eight successive evasions. Why do you ask me that question today? I have answered that question umpteen times. Yes, and the answer is umpteen times I have answered that question. My whole track record of having worked at the area of HIV and AIDS for the last 20 years is testimony. Why should you ask me that question today? And so it continued. It could not have been pleasant to see the cemeteries filling up while the black cloud of the arms deal remained hovering above. She struggled to escape this shadow reportedly offering the UK's Guardian newspaper that South Africa could not afford AIDS drugs because it needed submarines to deter US aggression. Subsequently, she denied having said this. In line with the Becky's admonition to ANC parliamentarians in 2000 that AIDS was principally a disease of poverty and poor nutrition, not the result of an infectious agent, she promoted lemons, garlic, African potatoes, and beetroot as effective countermeasures. Critics scorned her as Dr. Beetroot. Simultaneously, she claimed credit for recruiting Sangoma's traditional healers to help combat HIV-AIDS in rural areas by distributing condoms, thus ensnaring herself in the same web of contradiction as a Becky. He, in his letter to President Clinton and other world leaders, had written, An important part of the campaign that we are conducting seeks to encourage safe sex and the use of condoms. But at home, his need to rationalize the government's refusal to purchase and distribute antiretrovirals led him to deny to party members that AIDS was a sexually transmitted disease. The false claim, he told them, that it was sexually transmitted was being promoted by racists anxious to spread the stereotype that Africans were primitives, devoted to the sin of lust, who engaged in irresponsible sex with multiple partners. With this the country's leaders view, condom distribution efforts and safe sex billboards could only spread confusion. The three countries worldwide 
with even higher HIV-AIDS prevalence rates than South Africa, were its immediate neighbors, Swaziland, Botswana, and Lesotho. Their leaders accepted that HIV led to AIDS. Botswana became the first African country to seek to provide antiretrovirals to all its affected citizens. We are threatened with extinction, the president of Botswana, Festus Mogai, told the UN General Assembly. He and other leaders must have learned that Mbeki had disparaged Africans who accepted mainstream scientific thinking about AIDS as self-repressed victims of a slave mentality. Try as they might, it seemed that each successive attempt by Mbeki and his health minister to overcome a problem added another. This became evident once more in the wake of the announcement in July 2000 by the German pharmaceutical company Beringer Ingelheim that it was prepared to supply its antiretroviral drug, the Viripine, to the government for distribution to all HIV-infected pregnant women for five years at no charge. Recall that two years earlier, when the American pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline had offered to supply AZT to HIV-infected pregnant women at a reduced price, a price which would have added four-tenths of one percent to the national budget. That offer had been turned down by then-Health Minister Nkosazana Dalimi Sulma, citing cost. Cost couldn't be cited with respect to the Nevirapine offer. Dramini Zuma's successor as health minister, Dr. Mantu Chabalala Msibang, nevertheless rejected the offer. She explained that the drug would first have to be submitted for local testing, which would take five years. Despite it having already been cleared by the World Health Organization and the U.S.'s Food and Drug Administration, and had already proved its effectiveness, in several countries. But whether brand name antiretrovirals were offered at a reduced price for infected pregnant women as had happened two years earlier, or as in 2000 for free, the same objections applied. After their unmarried mothers succumbed to AIDS, the HIV-free newborns and infants would be orphans. They would have to be raised at state expense. But if mother-to-child transmission were allowed to occur and the babies died, this expense of caring for orphans would be avoided, allowing more of the government's limited poverty relief resources to be channeled to its productive and vocal constituents. Also, as previously mentioned, the first clinical trial of Viridine was about to begin at a military hospital in Tanzania. If the drug proved to be efficacious, the financial investment made in it by the ANC and party supporters would garner huge rewards cheap, effective viridine would sink the expensive antiretroviral competition. South Africa's leaders, whose support for the drug's testing in the face of successive discouragements had remained unwavering, would be hailed as far-seeing benefactors of tens of millions throughout the world. Memories of the many thousands of newborns who died after their mothers were denied free Mavira Pine in South Africa would be eclipsed. Meanwhile, the pressure build-up against the government's decision to turn down free Mavira Pine was inescapable. The Archbishop of Cape Town, Njongonkulu Ndugani, a former political prisoner on Robben Island, denounced the government's refusal to use the opportunity to curtail mother-to-child transmission 
as serious a crime against humanity as apartheid. Leaders of the principal Union Federation and the Communist Party, both partners of the ANC in the liberation struggle, joined anti-AIDS activists in opposing the decision. The Congress of South African Trade Union's General Secretary, Swellin Zima Favi, pointed to the success of Brazil, a country with similar income disparities to South Africa, in providing medication to its infected citizens and called on the government to declare national emergency. As the death rate continued to rise, the government's inaction became ever harder to maintain in the face of a sharp drop in antiretroviral prices, brought about by accusations of greed against the major pharmaceutical companies, relentless pressures from public health communities and international organizations, and competition from generics manufactured in India, the prospect for patients was quite different at the close of 2000 than in the beginning of the year, except in South Africa. The cabinet remained solid behind President Mbeki and his health minister. So did the ANC's entire 80-member policy-approving National Executive Committee. The ruling party held to a firm no against all entreaties. Even as the price of the antiretroviral triple combination treatment continued to be driven down by generic competition from $10,349 per patient per year in May 2000 to $295 by February of the following year. And even as the scale of the country's disaster mounted. All this while the grip that the stigma of HIV AIDS had held over the country was weakening. Many South Africans had died in silence and shame, including those who had contracted the disease from their spouses. Gugu Dlamini, a poor woman and anti-AIDS activist, was stoned to death in 1998 after she disclosed her HIV-positive status on the radio because, as some of her assailants were heard to say, her disclosure shamed their township. As mentioned, a veil of secrecy surrounded the death of Mbeki spokesman Parks Mankalana in 2000. But that same year, Walter and Albertina Susulu, both imprisoned during the liberation struggle, he with Mandela on Robben Island, announced the death of a son from AIDS. In 2004, Mangosutu Budelezi, the uncle of the Zulu king, and for decades one of the most important South African politicians, announced the deaths from AIDS of his son and daughter a prince and princess, and spoke about the devastation the disease has caused within the family circle. Soon after came Nelson Mandela's announcement of the death from AIDS of his oldest surviving son. Thus, by actions taken by persons both high and low, the stubborn taboo surrounding the disease was weakened, together with the claim that AIDS was a disease of poverty and poor nutrition. In August 2001, the Treatment Action Campaign, the country's leading AIDS activist organization, sued the Minister of Health in Pretoria High Court, charging that the refusal to distribute the viripine to all HIV-afflicted pregnant women dependent upon public health services violated two legally binding international conventions, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, signed and ratified by the former apartheid government, which guaranteed the health of women especially during pregnancy. When the judge ruled against the Minister of Health, her colleague, the Minister of Justice, announced 
that the judge's ruling to distribute the drug would not be enforced. Instead, the ruling would be appealed to the Constitutional Court, South Africa's Supreme Court. The first break in cabinet unity came in February 2002. It was made by Home Affairs Minister Buthelezi. This was two years before the death of two of his own children from AIDS. After years of seeing his home province, KwaZulu-Natal, suffering the worst of the health disaster laying waste to the country, he was no longer willing to remain silent nor accept his colleague's policy of inaction and obstruction. He told Parliament that KwaZulu-Natal would, quote, ensure that children are not born with a death sentence. He instructed the province's premier to offer the Viripine to all HIV-positive pregnant women there. A month later, the ANC National Executive Committee met to support Mbeki's opposition to the provision of antiretrovirals. The party's leaders reaffirmed government policy to not offer Viripine through the public health system to HIV-infected pregnant women and not to provide the drug to rape victims, nor to healthcare workers who had sustained accidental needle prick injuries. South Africa, the committee declared, would not be stampeded into precipitate action by pseudoscience, an uncaring drive for profits, or an opportunistic clamor for cheap popularity. Just days later, Mbeki received the results of the long-awaited study of administering Virodine to HIV-positive Tanzanian soldiers. The news must have come as a crushing disappointment. Virodine was no cure for HIV-AIDS. It had no effect on the HIV virus. The news would get out together with the reports about the millions of rands channeled to fund Virodine's trials, while so many were refused effective treatment and left to die. In the hope of limiting the political damage and warned by the finance minister and the governor of the South African Reserve Bank that the growing international notoriety of the government's AIDS policy was showing signs of depressing foreign investment. Mbeki led the cabinet into an abrupt policy reversal towards antiretroviral drugs. Not only would Neverapine be provided through the public health system to all HIV-positive pregnant women, as the High Court of Pretoria had instructed, also antiretrovirals would be made available to rape victims and accidentally infected nurses and other health workers. Three months later, the Constitutional Court, as the government anticipated, upheld the Pretoria High Court's order to provide the Varapine immediately. The distribution of the drug did not begin for another two years, not until a couple of weeks before voters went to the polls for the April 2004 national election, the ANC would again win a huge majority, allowing Mbeki to begin his second term as president. Four months later, the health minister announced that the government would not meet its target to supply antiretrovirals to but 53,000 persons by 2005. They were then more than four million South Africans infected, more than one person out of every ten. The price of a patient's annual supply of the needed drugs had fallen to less than two hundred dollars. This though, in a country where millions were trying to live on less than two dollars a day. Becky had staked his reputation on the idea that the current HIV AIDS drugs were dangerous toxins doing more harm than good. Efforts to correct him failed. His response to the prevailing scientific consensus was that the scientific consensus had once existed over the use of the morning sickness pill, thalidomide, with deadly results. But he had been forced to compromise. 
The Veripine was being offered in a limited way through the public health service. And compromised also was the picture Health Minister Manto Chabalala Msimang presented of South Africa's policy at the World's AIDS Conference in Toronto in August 2006. The official South African stand set out condoms and antiretrovirals, but also predominantly displayed lemons and garlic as ways to deal with AIDS. At the start of the conference, the display had also included apples, nectarines, and grapes, but these were quickly eaten by passing delegates. South African government policy was castigated once again, as sharply as during the apartheid era. The following month, while Mbeki attended the UN General Assembly, anger at his health minister bubbled up in the cabinet itself. Her foot dragging on antiretroviral distribution was attacked by the Minister of Social Development, Solis Kwewia. It was his department that was responsible, among its many other tasks, for seeking adoptions and arranging foster care for the rapidly increasing number of AIDS orphans, often sets of siblings. The following month, the stressed-out health minister was hospitalized, soon followed by readmission for a liver transplant, the result reportedly of years of heavy drinking. Mbeki placed HIV-AIDS policy administration with the deputy president, Pumzili Mlambo Nguka, who leaned on her personal friend, the deputy health minister, Naziswe Matlala Rutledge. Both women made no bones about attributing AIDS to HIV. Both considered antiretrovirals the only effective treatment. For a short while, the government was able to pursue a more aggressive drug therapy program for AIDS patients. But Matlala Rutledge didn't last in the health department. Among her political indiscretions was to describe AIDS denialism as existing at the very highest levels. Her firing by Mbeki in August 2007 set off nationwide protests. Three months later, Mbeki himself was removed by the ANC as the party leader. And less than a year after that, before completing his second term in office, he was forced to resign as president of South Africa. average life expectancy in South Africa after rising steadily for more than 30 years began to fall before apartheid ended. It dropped nine months in every year of the Mandela and Mbeki presidencies. Average life expectancy also fell even more precipitously in neighboring Botswana but Botswana's government began distributing antiretrovirals in 2002, two years before South Africa did. By 2005, only 15% of those needing antiretroviral treatment in Botswana were not yet receiving it, while 77% in South Africa were not receiving treatment. This limited distribution occurred even as the price of a year's supply of the triple combination drug treatment continued to fall. More than $10,000 per person in the first half of 2000, the cost had dropped to $64 during Mbeki's last year in office. Both Kagalema Motlanthi, who served as an interim president during the nine months after the ANC's dismissal of Mbeki from the presidency, and Jacob Zuma, the next elected full-term president, had accepted without question the government's AIDS policy during Mbeki's nine years in office. Zuma, while serving as deputy president under Mbeki, had headed the government's National AIDS Council, the key national body advising the government on HIV-AIDS. 
In 2006, during a trial in which he was acquitted of raping a 31-year-old family friend whom he knew to be HIV positive, he had testified that he had not used a condom, but as a precaution, had showered afterwards. Both Motlanthi and Zuma recognized the balance of forces had changed. Barbara Hogan, in prison for high treason during the apartheid regime who replaced Manto Jabalala Simang as health minister during Motlanthi's brief tenure, and Dr. Aaron Motsualeti, Zuma's appointee, were in no doubt that HIV caused AIDS and began working to overcome years of denial and obstruction and expand the country's AIDS program as rapidly as budgets and human resources permitted. A concerted effort was made to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV. This meant systematically testing pregnant women able to visit antenatal clinics and beginning antiretroviral treatment for those showing a weakened immune system. No doubt, because of budget worries, there was skipping here at first, both in the testing and the treatment. Initially, antiretroviral drug treatment was reserved only for women whose CD4 cells, the disease-fighting cells of the immune system, had been reduced by the virus to 200 or less per drop of blood. At this point, AIDS begins with the body virtually defenseless against infections of all kinds. It took two years before South Africa followed World Health Organization guidelines to begin drug treatment earlier when the CD4 cell count was down to 350. There was also delay, but eventual implementation of the World Health Organization's recommendation for not a single, but a two-drug regimen, AZT plus nevirapine, as this reduced mother-to-child transmission significantly more than nevirapine alone. Preventing mother-to-child transmission through birth wouldn't end the danger for newborns and infants. Breastfeeding by infected mothers could undo all the good done by the drug treatments during pregnancy and delivery. How to get formula milk to poor mothers, and also, where there was no clean pipe water, how to ensure that it was not mixed in dirty water, nor served in a bottle or cup that is not totally clean, were a few of the many problems requiring answers and actions before the government could save more of the 15,000 children dying of AIDS every year. By early 2012, AIDS in South Africa had claimed an estimated 2.8 million lives of all ages. So much more to be done, with no apparent endpoint. Testing. Messaging. Treating. Caring. Every year, half a million newly infected adults. More than 300,000 kids under 15 were living with the virus, needing drug therapy every day, every year, for the rest of their lives. Already, more than 2 million children without parents. Some more fortunate than others, what lay in store for them? What would become of South Africa when they were grown? Would the country's huge crime problem become more destructive? 
one-tenth of the largest employee group in the country, the public sector workforce, teachers, nurses, police, city engineers, railway workers, and others have become infected. When the government moved to bring a bit more relief to the poorest families by raising to 18, the age at which a child living at home could be claimed for the child support grant, the money to fund this meant less money to slow the spread of HIV infection in the prisons and among commercial sex workers. There were many such trade-offs. The HIV virus had become entrenched in the country. There is yet no vaccine and no cure. Enabling people infected with the virus to live longer as a result of treatment with antiretrovirals also means that the virus lives longer and so has additional opportunities to infect others. By 2012, South Africa had 5.7 million infected with HIV, including this mother and her child, more than any other nation. 1.8 million of them had then been brought into a treatment program, also more than in any other nation. However, an additional 5 million are expected to become infected during the next 20 years even if the nation more than doubles its already substantial financing for treatment and prevention. According to a study by the country's leading advisory body on AIDS policy, nearly doubling the pool of persons from which the virus can spread is a terrible prospect. But merely to keep the new infections from not exceeding the projected 5 million mark will require an expenditure of $5.1 billion during each of the next 20 years. $3 billion more every year than the $2.1 billion currently being spent on AIDS programs. The Deputy Chairman of the South African National AIDS Council, a group made up of leaders from government and civil society, said he did not know where any extra financing would come from. I think the budget is strained already, he said. Who could have imagined less than a generation back when the darkness of centuries of racial oppression lifted, the horror that lay ahead. And yet, there was more.